Um, the Old and New Project is an initiative that engages in cross-tendency, cross-generational revolutionary dialogue about historical analysis, theory, and contemporary issues. And today we have three panelists who um, will be discussing the new, the new left and um, leadership for today. We have, I guess, should we just go in the order that we're, you're sitting in? Sure. Perhaps? Okay, so first, <laughs> Dikui Kiani Siddiqui um, is a co-producer of um, and co-host of Where We Live, a weekly public affairs show on listener-sponsored WBAI. She's an educator for Liberation and chair of the Malcolm X Commemoration and Sekou Odinga Defense Committees, as well as a contributor to the Huffington Post. She is the wife of recently released POW Sekou Odinga, as well as a mother and grandmother. <laughs> and I guess I can introduce the two of you after. Yeah, of okay. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I thank you for being here. Um, as Deb said, I um, in addition to, um, to some of those things, one is the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee. Um, uh, the question was, how do you identify? And I would say that um, as an African Cherokee Shinnecock woman, I also advocate for black feminists. I'm a black, na I'm an obviously black um, nationalist. I was a member of um, the Black Panther Collective, which served as my introduction to U.S. held political prisons. This is how I got to be involved in fighting for, advocating, and working on behalf of U.S. held political prisoners and prisoners of war by going to visit. The Black Panther Collective was made up of people who were original members of the Black Panther Party and other activists. And so I have worked with and studied with and under um, members of the Black Panther Party because the Black Panther Collective was about continuing the legacy and the work of the Black Panther, of the Black Panther Party. Um, as the chair of the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee, that is an organization that was created by um, Herman Ferguson, who is now an ancestor. Well, m many of them are. Yuri Kuchiyama, um, Jean Reynolds. There were several people who were members of Malcolm's Organization of Afro-American Unity who in 1996, I think it was, when in 96, when Mal, or what's his name? Spike Lee mm -hmm. came out with the movie on um, Malcolm, his version of Malcolm. People who knew and loved Malcolm and studied under Malcolm and followed his principles were really disturbed and concerned about the distortions of Malcolm's legacy and his history. And so that gave birth to uh, the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee by those people who had been members, some of those people who had been members of Malcolm's organization. And so part of what we do at the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee is um, we do a dinner every year to pay tribute to the families of our political prisoners, many of whom have been in prison for 30 and 40 years. I mean, we are, the, you know, there's much talk about the 50th commemoration of the anniversary of the Black Panther Party. Well, we have people who have been in prison for almost that long. Mm -hmm. um, and so we talk about that because when we talk about the next left and we talk about connecting the old with the new, it's very important that people understand the relationship that activism and radical politics and revolutionary struggle have today is what happened in the past. Like we have these cards up here that have Harriet Tubman on one side, right? Harriet Tubman in 1840 was not considered a hero and a shero like she is today. She was considered a criminal. She had a wanted, um, a, what is that? A reward, a bounty on her head for $40,000, right? Which in 1840, maybe that would have been $2 million, right? On the back of the card, on the other side, we have a picture of Harriet Tubman, right, um, who has said out of her own mouth she feels very much like a runaway slave. And so, no, Asada, I'm sorry, I said Harriet, thank you, Asada Shakur, who's living in Cuba, in, in, uh, in exile in Cuba, right? So with a $2 million reward on her head and a tag that says um, terrorist. So when we talk about the next laugh and the old and the new, Harriet on one side, Asada on the other side to make very clearly those um, those links. 
And so the, when I when I the question was like one of the questions is one of the what political approach of that historical tendency do you think is crucial to maintain? I think several things come to mind. One, the Black Panther Party's ten point platform and program made plain that black people's oppression wasn't just about racism in this apartheid uh, America, but it was capitalism, imperialism, and colonialism. Right? It means move, moving us forward means bridge high. Moving us forward requires bridging the historical past with the present and the future. Dr. John Henry Clark said, we must study where we were, where we are, and where we are going. How did things get to where it is today? My grandmother used to say that ain't nothing new under the sun and it ain't. Struggle has been waged against the settler colonial state from 1492 to 1619 respectively. As America began its crusade of genocide of indigenous people and enslavement of African people. Our task is to educate people about the protracted struggles oppressed people have engaged in, armed and otherwise. We use music, culture, art, poetry, civil disobedience, self-defense, and yes, armed struggle. We must talk about how this country's so-called integration, COINTELPRO's war of black liberation, its so-called war on drugs that initiated the disappearance of millions of black men, followed by black women and now black children, led to what we call the prison industrial complex or mass imprisonment. And we have to continue to create, and how it continues to create the myriad of economic injustices that the Black Panther Party dealt with when you look at its 10-point platform and program, from lack of decent housing and schools, hunger, no access to health care, police terror and murder, um, the poverty. At that time, it was the draft, but now it's a poverty draft, so it's the same damn thing. right? People go into the military because they don't have any other choices. right? And so it's a poverty draft. And so the Black Panther Party and its 10-point platform and program dealt with all of those issues around military, around housing, around all of that. And so we have to incorporate, when we talk about the old and the new, we have to bring that history into today to show that, not like my grandmother said, there's nothing new under the sun. The same issues and social injustices the Black Panther Party was talking about in 1960s are the same things that is that people are struggling for or against in 2016. You know, as it relates to poor and working class black, brown, Asian, white people around this around this country. And the other thing that was so important about that those historical times is people understood what capitalism, imperialism, and colonialism was doing. So you had solidarity, not just in in um, in word, but in deed. Today, when we talk about U.S. held political prisoners, they are not just, while the Black Panther Party has 15 members in prison, but we also have white anti-imperialists, right? We have Bill Dunn, we have David Gilbert, we have people who have crossed over, we have Marilyn Bach, who is a white anti-imperialist, we have Laura Whitehorn, who is out now, Susan Rosenberg, who is out now, but we had solidarity in action, like people really understanding that, as Malcolm says, we have a common oppressor, right? And once we get past the, the different specificities of how we endure oppression or struggle against oppression, that it's still oppression and it might take different forms and people might struggle in different ways, but it's still about building that solidarity. And I think that that's a great lesson that we can learn from the past. Not that it was perfect, because people mm -hmm. still had to be checked on male privilege, and people still had to be checked on white <coughs> privilege, right, class privilege, but there was still some working dynamics that made movements happen, that helped people to believe that revolution was going to occur in their lifetime. So the work of us today is helping people to believe, not, not only or if possible, that revolution in their lifetime, but that it's worth fighting for. So even if you do not see what it is that you hope to see, that you are laying the foundation for, how many people are here are parents? Mm -hmm. Grandparents. 
Okay. Not yet, right? I'm a grandmother. What kind of world do I want my grandchildren to inherit? And what kind of world do I want to help to be creating for when my granddaughter and my grandson are grandparents, right? And so that's what we do when we talk about connecting the past into the, um, into the present and the, um, and the future. I want to say also that one of the most important things that we need to maintain from the past is study and political education, right? It's not enough to not like something. That may serve as the impetus, right? Like Malcolm says, you have to be angry. Anger is not a bad emotion. It's how, we, how it manifests with us individually and collectively, right? So we have to be motivated by something that we don't like or something that we would like to see. But in order to sustain that through the being tired, in order to sustain that through the people that you're going to come in contact with that don't see things the way that you do. In order to sustain that through not having the immediate gratification or the things that we would like to see happen, we must study. We must understand that struggle is protracted. And we don't, as I said, see everything that we want to see. But the idea is and the principle is that we commit ourselves to struggle because this is what people behind us did. This is the people whose shoulders we stand on, right? They didn't see, as an a descendant of enslaved Africans, they, uh, they didn't see what I see, right? Mm -hmm. And But it didn't mean that they didn't struggle. So it's understanding, it's understanding the need to study and political education, addressing people's material needs, finding ways to do that, because theory is wonderful, but we also need the practice because people have to eat. People need employment. People, we need meeting spaces, right? To have meetings, to hold events. So meeting the uh, material needs, having community <coughs> resources, um, real estate, having offices. I mean, the Black Panther Party had offices that people could go to. Where do people go now to even know that people are actively struggling and actively organizing, right? So it, it means having, as I said, collective solidarity and action. And it's people's understanding that oppressed people have a right to defend themselves, their families and their communities, as, as Malcolm says, and as people all over the world says, by any means necessary. Not, you know, whether or not you agree with the principles of armed self-defense or armed struggle. Do people have a right to do that? So when the media gets on, you know, people talk about riots in Ferguson. They were not rioting. They were rebelling, mm -hmm. right? So not saying, that, well, I choose to struggle this way, so you have to choose to struggle in that way, this same <laughs> way. No, it's recognizing that people have the right to choose and determine their own methods of, of, of struggling, okay? So things went wrong. A lot of things went wrong, but a lot of things went right. We have the legacy of the what went right. Children eat school breakfast. There are food pantries. There are free and health uh, sliding scale health clinics. There's lots of programs that were implemented during that time. We have people who continue to do work as educators to carry on those traditions. What is important to know that what went wrong was not understanding just how vicious the state would be in its violence against progressives and radicals in those movements. And so paying attention to who's around you and what they're doing, what they're saying. Are you with people who are inciting you or instigating people to do things? Are you with people who are trustworthy? Have people just come out of the middle of nowhere? Have you developed relationships with people to really understand where, who it is that you're working with? Because what was illegal with COINTELPRO is, not, is now legal under Homeland Security and the Patriot Act and the Military Defense Authorization Act. So you really have to try to get to know the people, not in a nosy kind of way, but in an investigatory way. Like, who are you sitting by? Who are you working with? So then you don't get caught up in some <coughs> kind of conspiracy charge that leads you to some political imprisonment that, that is not necessarily about some action that you took, but rather some setup that you, know, that you, were, that you were caught up in. So I guess I'm going to stop there, and then hopefully people will have questions and a discussion. Okay, thank you. All right, next. <laughs>
Matt Meyer. And now the book. Were you applause? All right. Matt Meyer, a native uh, New York City based educator, activist, and author, is the War Resisters International Africa Support Coordinator and a United Nations ECO SOC representative. <laughs> of the International Peace Research Association, the founding chair of the Peace and Justice Studies Association, and former chair of the Consortium on Peace Research, Education, and Development, Meyer has long worked to bring together academics and activists for lasting social change. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Dick. It's really wonderful um, to be here on this panel, especially surrounded by these amazing people. Um, quite honored to be talking about old left, new left, and next left. Uh, uh, so nice to be representing the old, uh, I think, I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, I guess uh, I want to try to briefly talk about two pieces of bad news and two pieces of good news. Um, but since the topic of political prisoners, and especially the Panthers, has already been brought up by Dequi, but also by this historic moment. I mean, it's just a present here. I mean, you can't really, if you're paying attention, and hopefully we're all paying attention to a certain degree, but if you're paying attention to Black Lives Matter, you may not really know much about who Asada is, but you know that at the beginning and the end of each of your, your meetings, you're going to be reciting some of Asada's mm -hmm. words. Huh? Mm -hmm. And you, you may not know uh, who, who Seiko Odinga was, although I think we just told you, you may not know that he walked in the room and is in the back there sort of quietly trying to be uh, fading into uh, the conversation. But you know, at least you've heard of the Black Panthers and you understand there is this legacy and it wasn't even, hopefully if you're in New York, it wasn't even just this West Coast thing that's celebrating its 50th anniversary in October. It was a national, it was an international thing, and uh, in some ways the cutting edge of that thing uh, is still uh, part of the imprisoned population. So we can talk about uh, mass incarceration and we can work against uh, the prison industrial complex, but there are also these guys, uh, some women, mainly from the move movement, but uh, mainly guys who have been in prison for 20, for 30, for 40, for 40 plus years, which is just a ridiculous amount of time. So since she said that already, uh, and since uh, Raymond Nat Turner, who, who will be now all five panelists are in the room and who will be dazzling us with poetry in a few minutes, but since he didn't get to open, he'll do it a little later, I'm going to read a little excerpt of a poem by one of those panthers. Uh, it's actually a recent book of poetry by J Jaleel Muntaquim uh, called Escaping the Prison Fade, Escaping the Prison Fade to Black. Uh, and if you don't know this book, it is available downstairs not by any of the sponsoring co-publishers, but by Chris Lebedev, but we've worked together. And uh, I'll just say this, uh, reading Jaleel's word to help bring him into the room. How serious will it be if you were to seize the time, seize the rhythm and seize the rhyme, seize the mental madness in our lives, like a chokehold, squeezing equality out of greed, giving it to the needy, stepping over the waste that capitalism expels from its public schools for lack of financial support, as prisons are filled with functional illiterates for just a start. How serious will it be if you were to seize the time, seize the rhythm, seize a rhyme, seize the mental madness in our lives, and bring into existence a dream that was shattered by a sniper's bullet or the black prince shot down by assassins in the ballroom whose action were seized by the disease of white supremacy. Free Julio Winter. Absolutely. All I think one piece of the bad news is uh, encapsulated in the title of uh, this book that I co edited uh, with Elizabeth Petita Martinez and Mandy Carter which P. Impressed, one of the co-sponsors, does publish, and we have some copies up here for sale. We have not been moved. And the reason we chose that title in a book talking about racism and militarism in contemporary US history is that, in some ways, the gauntlet that was thrown down, especially to whites, within the revolutionary upsurges of the 60s, you know, the 60s, that time period that began in 1954 and ended around 1978, <coughs> 79, the 60s, 
uh, that gauntlet that said, not that you should leave the movement, not, not that you should uh, go home, we don't need you, uh, not that, in fact, uh, they were irrelevant. When people ask Brother Malcolm about white people, he said, oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm thinking about white people like John Brown. We could use some support people like that. And the fact of the matter is, the idea that, in fact, uh, whites should and could go into our own communities and work deeply against racism at its roots, an idea that was put forward by the organizers of the Student Nonviolent Coordinator from East SNCC as early as 1966-67 by people like uh, Kwame Ture, Sokli Carmichael, who also popularized the phrase, hell no, we won't go, in terms of drafted military stuff, and popularized uh, the Black Power Movement. And Kwame said, look, we're going to maintain our alliances, we're going to maintain our communications, but we don't have to be in the same organization, in the same space all the time. Yeah, we like it, it's cool. For us white people, it's really groovy. Thank you very much for letting us hang out, share the panel, share the space, share the organization. But that's not all we can do, feeling so groovy and so cool, hanging out and sharing the space. There is a more uncomfortable thing, a more disorienting thing, and in some ways a more urgent thing we need to do, which is looking at racism, white supremacy, <coughs> fascism at its roots, so that Oh, say large movements of white supremacists can't be organized to support, you know, like other white supremacists who are running for president. That's the harder stuff. Not to just rail against it from the corner, but to go into it and fight against it at its roots. And essentially, we have not been moved to take up that cry, that gauntlet. Not in an organizational way, not in a consistent way, not in a militant way, not in a way that speaks to that revolutionary call those decades ago. And the other bad news is, is news really that, that uh, De Kui spoke to and <coughs> Sekou lives a, lives a life of uh, more eloquent than I can say. But we can talk about truth, and we can even talk about truth and reconciliation, and truth and reconciliation coming to America, and we can talk about uh, building a movement against mass incarceration. But until we work to make freeing the political prisoners, to make freeing the Panthers in particular, uh, to make that a priority of the entire movement. So you cannot have a group of two or 3,000 leftists come together for a weekend every year and not even have a mention of it on a plenary level. You know, to me, that, that is a historic priority. It is about learning from history. We cannot talk about learning from history when the master teachers, when the master teachers are still behind bars. You know, I was able uh, just 10 days ago to visit Jaleel and to visit uh, David Gilbert. And David was just moved in a pretty traumatizing move for him mm -hmm. uh, to a space about 10 miles from Buffalo where there's a vibrant uh, anti-imperialist community. Very, very cool. And the main thing I said, in addition to saying, you know, visit him, support him, do what you need to do, is I said, listen, if you want a, a, master, a master class, if you want, oh, let's say a post-doctorate class in fighting against imperialism, the, the main teacher is like now, you know, a, a, a 20 minute drive away. And we can't talk about learning from history until we get these brothers and a couple of sisters out, these master teachers. And then when they come out, to learn from them. Mm -hmm. You know, to say, oh, okay, yeah, you're the folks we need to be getting our honorarium to. You're the folks we need to be having some weekend time with, without the cameras on and all that jazz. That, not because you can tell us everything we need to know, but because the dialogue is the only way, collectively, we're going to move the movement forward. Now, Deb says I have one minute to tell you the good news, so it's really her fault that it's going to be <laughs> negative, but Sorry. I will take the time. I will keep the time. Um, I think, oh, and now I can't really understand this note. <laughs> so me, that oh, is so me. So <laughs> bad. What did I write? I'm going to just take the minute trying to read my own handwriting. No. <laughs> Certainly one piece of good news is that we're at a particular moment now. And it's a moment, I think, of extraordinary opportunity. Uh, my little collective is uh, doing a, uh, an event, and we'll have time for conversations about uh, upcoming events and dates. But on June 25th, Resistance in Brooklyn is doing an event on crisis and opportunity, Trump, white supremacy, fascism, question mark building new resistance movements. De Kui is going to be one of the speakers at that event. And, uh, you know, that, that is an event to talk about 
building resistance movements in this particular moment, in what I have to say is a Black Lives Matter moment, not just because it all revolves around Black Lives Matter. It could take a Justice League kind of a superhero, superheroine manifestation. It could take a million hoodies kind of manifestation. <laughs> there are lots of different manifestations in all different cities, communities, neighborhoods, but it is a moment of, in my own personal life, unparalleled excitement and possibility, unparalleled opportunity. So that is some of the good news. I am sure I have another piece of good news that I scribbled down here, and I will think of it, and in the Q&A, I will tell that to you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. We await that piece of good news with anticipation. But next up is Carmen Perez, who is the co-founder of Justice League New York City and, and, and excuse me, an executive director of Gathering for Justice. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Great. I just kind of want to wake you all up. Um, but yes, my name is Carmen Perez, and I am a co-convener and a facilitator of spaces. Um, I facilitate space in detention centers and in prisons. I've been working in prisons since I was 19 years old. I'm now 39. And I believe that those that are incarcerated um, are my relatives. And it's because I come from uh, generations and decades of incarceration. As I look outside, um, I'm extremely saddened. And I don't know why I got sad, but it's because I would never be able to live in any of those apartments outside. And, but if I look um, in California and if I drive about five hours, I will pass by four or three prisons and I know that I have a relative in a prison. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's important to do the work and to bring the voices of those that are incarcerated out into the streets, uh, whether I'm at a panel or if I'm marching, if I'm protesting or if I'm advocating for somebody, um, it's important for me to bring people like Baba. Seku into the space and into the room and say their name. And so I just kind of wanted to start with that just because my work is not necessarily <coughs> something that I read in a book. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn uh, de-incarceration or mass incarceration because it became sexy actually when Michelle Alexander um, put it into academia. But in the work that I've done, it's the way in which life was. I grew up in a small farm town outside of Los Angeles by the name of Oxnard, uh, not Oxford, but Oxnard. <laughs> and, uh, and I grew up around three naval bases, and so there was a lot of diversity in my community. There were people who were from the Philippines, uh, Samoan, black, from the south, and Chicano. Um, and then on the beach of Oxnard, which were really beautiful, a lot of white folks lived. And I didn't really know that um, there was racism and there was all these isms until I went away to college when I was described as a person of color and I was like, yo, I'm kind of the same color as Matt, you know? But the labels that are put on us um, in order to keep us down. And I say all that because it's really what's informed the work that I do. It's really what has given me the heart to continue on a path to seek justice um, not only for my people, but for black people, for poor white people, for indigenous people. And so when I think about the past, right, and all the civil, civil liberties that were won through the civil rights movement, one of the things that I learned from my mentor, my boss, Harry Belafonte, is that when he last sat with Dr. King, was that Dr. King had said to him, you know, I think we're integrating into a burning house. Mm. And so Mr. Belafonte then asked, well, what do we do? And Dr. King then said, we become firemen, mm -hmm. which is a very interesting, interesting concept, right, that we're constantly looking at how to, how to put out the fires. Well, I think our generation and those that have come before us, the in-betweeners like the Mats and the Dequies, and so I always say in-between because they're bridge keepers, right? They're between our elders yes. and our youth and are able to bridge the gaps. But what I say is that we, they are the gardeners. They're no longer the firemen. They're the gardeners who are planting the seeds for our generation to be able to have a lane and a platform to do this work. They are the ones that are watering and nurturing us 
when we feel as though we are defeated by whether it's the system or, mm -hmm. you know, some people call it the white man that we can't see or it's the Trumps, <laughs> whatever it may be, they're the ones that are making sure that we're okay. And so what I love about this panel is the fact that mm -hmm. I get to sit in space with some powerful people some people who have dedicated their lives and who give me and Brittany the energy to continue. Because yes, it does look like the face of Justice League, right? Justice League is a task force of formerly incarcerated individuals, artists, communication directors, ad advocacy experts, young people coming together to build collective power. Because what we see within one another is value. Mm -hmm. I don't see Britney and Million Hoodies as competition because personally I can't go out and save the world. I can't be in every prison. I can't be in Ferguson and Baltimore and New York and Little Rock, Arkansas. But I could be in a space and share space with people in order for us to do this work collectively. And so what I will also say about the past, and, and I'm very grateful for people whose shoulders I stand on, because of them I get to sit here. <clears throat> because back in the day when I was younger and my community was entrenched, and it's still entrenched with violence, gangs, domestic violence, and drugs, because my community hasn't gotten better, it just has a new face, mm -hmm. right? It has an undocumented population face. And they're now getting a lot of the isms, they're getting a lot of the oppression put onto them than what we face. And you know, unfortunately, some of us are doing that to them as well. So I need to also take responsibility for that. But the community that I grew up in, in Southern California, was a community very similar to the Bronx, the South Bronx, very similar to East New York. It just looked different. We had different buildings, right? And uh, we celebrated our heroes, like the Dr. Kings, once a year on one day in a very, very, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, I can't think of it right now because I'm thinking about all these other things. But in a way that wasn't true to our own history, right? It wasn't true to the work that we, who we were. Um, Dr. King didn't die because he had a dream. He died because he was becoming radical and he was talking about economic development. He was talking about black liberation. Right? And so when we also think about Malcolm X, he wasn't a violent human being, he didn't kill anybody. Right? But he talked about any means necessary because he wanted us to own our power. Mm -hmm. And what's really frightening about today's time is the fact that we don't take the time to learn our history. Mm -hmm. We don't know our history. I just presented as a keynote speaker at my alma mater at UC Santa Cruz, uh, at the Cesar Chavez convocation for the Chicano Latino Resource Center. I asked. 50 kids, 50 young people, not kids, because they're not children. 50 young people, what do you guys know about the Chicano movement? Mm -hmm. who, and I said, who are the leaders of the Chicano movement? And nobody knew. Because mm -hmm. it's not Cesar Chavez. Mm -hmm. Cesar Chavez was the leader of the United Farm Workers Movement. Mm -hmm. It was Corky Gonzalez and Reyes Tijenides who were the leaders of the Chicano movement. And what we did back in the day, or, and you know, I might be corrected here, is that we centered our movements around individuals and personalities, right? And so when Dr. King, when he called upon Corky Gonzalez and he called upon the American Indian Movement and the poor white folks to come together for the Poor People's Campaign, what happened to him? He was assassinated about a month or two later. Why? Because he was trying to build collective power. He was trying to build something, and they knew that if they cut it off, right, they knew if they cut off the spider's head, it would die. And so what happened to the Poor People's Campaign? It died, right, because people couldn't get it together. People couldn't see the value within one another. They saw each other as competition. Let me lead. And I think the beautiful thing about this movement today, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement, the immigration reform movement, the LGBTQ is that it's a decentralized structure. So there's room for all of us. There's a podium for all of us. But we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our elders. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the people that were constantly going and meeting with the men and women that were incarcerated and bringing back the knowledge to our communities. 
we wouldn't be here. And I say that because it's important to continue to build intergenerational relationships. Mm -hmm. It's important to continue to build entry points for people to get involved. And so I may have somebody who's a slacktivist who's like sharing on Facebook and tweeting, we need you. We need the people who could donate to the movement too because like, sister, you said, it's true. We can't, who said it, was it? Gandhi or Nelson Mandela, poverty is violence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's violence. I remember marching down, uh, marching in a protest, and there was about 17 of us that got out of a suburban, right? Because if somebody's got a car, you all have a car, so you're about mm -hmm. to share a ride somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the, the crazy thing about it, it reminded me of growing up. There was five of us, <laughs> two parents, you know, there's about 14 kids that would jump out of a car. I remember my basketball coach would make do with the little car and all of us. I would always be the one, because I used to be the skinniest, the one that would be laying on somebody and put your head down, put your head down. So we still do it that way. But what's unfortunate about some of the new activists is the fact that we never learned about our history and we criticize, so we fight against police brutality and we fight against all these structures of oppression, yet we oppress each other. Mm -hmm. And we say, we can't believe you showed up in an SUV. Mm -hmm. You don't belong here with your Louis Vuittons <coughs> or your whatever. You're part of the problem. And you associate yourself with, with artists, and artists don't belong here either. Mm -hmm. But I come from a mentor who dedicated his life to the movement. Harry Belafonte flew money in to the Delta to ensure that SNCC was able to continue to operate. And so because a lot of our activists, young activists, don't know the history, we perpetuate the same cycles of violence that we're trying and oppression that we're trying to fight against. And so I try to bring the great news. And the great news is that there is a special <coughs> moment right now, and it's a movement. Yes. It's a movement. And, you know, the, the work that we do within the Gathering for Justice is looking at the long distance runner. Mr. Balafonte founded us in 2005 to find our interconnectedness with one another and build a movement to end child incarceration. Mm -hmm. What Justice League does is we are the rapid response arm. We are the ones that are on the ground assessing and, in sh and feeding the long term because not everybody is set to be a long distance runner. We know that, right? But we have to make room for them, but also provide a space where they're educated. And so for me, what I tell young people and I tell you all is learn our history, <coughs> learn each other's history. I continue to be in spaces that is extremely binary very black and white. And I'm a Chicana woman. My father's 92 years old. And he was born in 1924 in Anaheim, California. My mother's from Mexico. <clears throat> and I consider myself an American woman. So when people say to me, like, oh, wow, you speak English so good. Your <laughs> English is so well. I say, thank you. You know, I learned <laughs> so English first. Yeah, so is yours. <laughs> um, but I wanna make sure that the way in which I show up for people that they show up for me as well. Mm -hmm. Because I'm committed to this work. I've been in this work since I was 19 years old. And actually prior to that, you know, as a little peer helper president here and there. But it is my responsibility to turn my hand back and reach for those and also be that bridge. And also be the person that could support and cultivate the leadership of young people. And so I will say that, you know, the past complemented with the mm. present will only lead to a better future. So thank you. Thank you. All right. You want to switch seats so that the camera's yeah. good? Yeah, I'll switch oh, seats. Yeah, I'll switch seats. Okay, Okay, <laughs> next up is Brittany Williams, who is uh, the Manager of Arts and Culture with Million Hoodies Movement for Justice. She's also the New York City Chapter Leader of Million Hoodies for Justice. And I will leave it to you. Hi, y'all. Hey. <laughs> How y'all 
doing? Y'all don't sound like y'all doing good. We need y'all to get tired well, up a little bit. Call the response. Call the response. I go. I go. Right. When I say I go, you say I may. I go. I may. So I'm calling and I'm asking you to listen. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel <laughs> with so much history and knowledge. Like, <clears throat> yes, it's, 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 I'm all over the place right now. I'm an artist and I, I'm really close to my emotions. Mm -hmm. And um, I came into this work um, through Million Hoodies for Justice, um, which is a racial justice network and our, we are building, we say human rights leaders because the fight that we're having or we're seeing is not new. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't have to fight for our human rights, our holistic rights. We should be able to be here present, not having to worry about surviving. Or, you know, and I want to say that the Black Lives Matter movement, we have our first political prisoner. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and this, yes, I forgot his name. Josh. Yeah. Josh. Yeah. We have our first political prisoner right now. So it's Baba Seku sits in the back. He, someone is, is going through that right now in this movement. I just, I'm giving us time to let that sink in. Mm. So what does that really mean? What does that really mean in this time when, we, we, when people are saying this is just a moment, when it's really a movement? Mm -hmm. People's lives are at stake. Mm -hmm. um, I came into this work because I've been over police since I was 11 years old. I remember if you miss, if you miss curfew and you're out <coughs> after the street lights are on, it's a paddy wagon truck. I'm, I'm from the South. And while the railroad track still exists, that separates black and white, and you know you can't go over the, the railroad tracks that still exist in Miami, Florida, <laughs> right? And so, if you pass, if you out past the street lights, it's a paddy wagon truck that is coming after you to come take you to juvenile. And so, I grew up in a culture world where. I would always be running from the police, mm. <laughs> trying to get into the house or, you know, something like that. Um, and I'm very passionate about the work. And I'm, I'm conflicted. <laughs> and also conflicted in this moment right now, you know, because we're here fighting the same fight, you know? And we still have another political prisoner. I'm gonna keep saying that because it's, it's real and we have someone in the space who has lived that life. And that cycle will not be broken. It has restarted again. So what would that look like? 10, 15 years from now. And so with Million Hoodies for Justice, we're, we're thinking about this. What are the ways that we, how do we build human rights leaders that are in the, in the study, in the political study? We just launched an Ella Baker leadership program, mm -hmm. <laughs> which allows all the leaders to connect. We are a network in about 10 cities. And so we study together in this process. So what does it mean to study together? What does it mean to have an analysis, a political analysis, that, that is really digging into not just our history, but lo lo history from, from <coughs> like a political point, but locally? What, 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 has our, what are our experiences and things like that? So, I'm sorry, I need to take a breath. Can we do a collective breath right yes. now? Can we inhale, exhale. One more with the sound, inhale, exhale.
in all honesty, I have nieces and nephews that may be on their way to prison <coughs> because they've been diagnosed with ADHD. <coughs> we know these labelings provide ways that they can make us sure when we talk about the prison to pipeline system, yes. mm -hmm. that they have a bed in the prison over a, a proper education. Yes. <coughs> and so, what are the ways that we can target in this movement that we're running right now that, that's happening based off the history? Being able to see the Afro future as clear as possible I was actually going to do this exercise, but then I realized um, envisioning the Afro future, but when I'm looking out, it's not many, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> it, looks like, it looks like a beautiful future. Yes, <laughs> yes, it does, it does, it does. But I, I want all of us to think about what does it look like to imagine an Afro future. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do the exercise, that's what I plan to do anyways, right? I'm an artist. Can we all close our eyes for one second? <coughs> I would like to invite you to imagine freedom as it relates to the Afro future. What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it sound like? What role do you play? <coughs> what role have you played? <coughs> now I want you to take that out into your bodies and feel your neighbor because that connection is what's going to connect us all together. That's what we're going to need in this, in this moment, is to actually connect with each other to get this done. Because I am not free until my neighbor is free. Mm -hmm. I am not free until my ancestors can stop screaming. I am not free until this land can stop bleeding. Native blood, African blood. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. <laughs> so how was the envisioning of Afro future? <coughs> good music, man. It's some good music. You heard some good music. I'm just powerful. Ah. Unity. Unity. What other, what other things came up? Land and independence. Land and independence. Determination. Self determination. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Fresh air, clean air. Fresh air, clean air. Children. Children. Mm -hmm. Sound of kids laughing. Sound of yeah. kids laughing. Mm -hmm. uh, individuality. Individuality. Mm -hmm. Green Good. space. Green space. Jazz. 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 <laughs> I'm sorry, I was conflicted because I knew I was supposed to do this exercise, but I was not obeying what I really yeah. needed to do. And so, when I closed my eyes and did this before I got here, I imagined to just be able to walk down the street and not have to worry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is just something that is so simple. Mm -hmm. I imagine to just go into my community and have a Whole Foods outlet. You know, the outlets that are spaces that are cheaper. I don't have a grocery store in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I don't even have a pharmacy in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We only got one, we only have a liquor store. <coughs> That's it. So, I mean, I, in talking about Million Hoodies, we're, we're a great organization. 
But I, <laughs> I've realized the world in many different ways from an artist. And as an artist, how do we provide space for people to actually dive in? So my role is to dive into arts and culture. Because we understand culture is what binds us all and separates us at the same time. So how do we build a culture that is pro-black, and taking out the anti-racism at the same time. You know, like, does that mean pulling on the gloves? <laughs> <laughs> right? And so when we're looking at, <coughs> you talked about decentralizing this movement, right? But we couldn't decentralize this movement right now if we didn't have the history. Right. We couldn't, because we, that, that history lies as, like, a platform, our, like our DNA, mm. like we have that. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a baby. I'm, I was born in the '80s, right? Mm -hmm. So the '60s and the '70s, all that is in my bloodstream. <laughs> and what Trayvon Martin did was activate what was already in me, mm -hmm. because understanding that. Our DNA is tied to environment, it's tied to what we eat, it's tied to when we go to bed, it's tied to every single thing. But how do we continue it is the question. How do we continue to activate things that already lies dormanted in ourselves? Mm. And so my realization from the arts is how do I Throw it, you know, throw in the propaganda. Or is this already a platform that's there already? Emory, um, United Nations. Well, who, is, who is that? You all are doing, no, not um, urban. No, it's the Urban Justice League. No, Urban Justice Center. Mm -hmm. Urban Justice Center is doing, um, if you all are in New York, please visit. They're doing um, his. The exhibition of his work here. Oh. Yes, please visit. Emory Douglas. Emory Douglas. <coughs> yes, they're doing it. Where is it? Um, at the, the Urban Justice Center. They have the, the whole exhibition of his work online. So we, we come from a strong background, and I'm feeling as if, like, all we have to do is continue. Mm -hmm. Continue. We gonna fail. We gonna we gonna do all of this, right? But just continuing to push forward, and with that imagination, and with the history, which allows us to be in this moment right now, present and ready. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> To finish things up, I'm going to call our fifth panelist, who's actually back there in the corner. <laughs> you, were you willing to come up and, and close us out with a poem? Uh, Raymond Nat Turner of the Black Agenda Report? Yes, hello. Uh, where, where to oh, come on how, about, how about right here? <laughs> right here? Here? No, yeah, that'll work. Any, any old place. Okay, first, uh, firstly, um, I wanted to apologize for, for being late. I'm seeming to develop quite a reputation here. It's been late. You know, I'm still getting my New York sea legs from Cali, you know. So I apologize. And then secondly, I'd like to um, recognize uh, Deborah, uh, Matt, and the other organizers of the panel and, um, you know, um, express my regards to Carmen and Brittany and uh, other panelists and uh, Brother Sekou Odinga. I, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize him. So um, what I wanted to do is make a brief comment before uh, doing this piece that's been resonating for me for quite some time. Um, have any of you seen the film Reds? It was a film that uh, I, I believe it came out in the 1980s. Yeah. I strongly encourage you to see it because it was about the uh, communist movement in the U.S. and also the Russian Revolution. And um, <coughs> it focused on John Reed. And John Reed was a writer and he was an organizer of these um, 
writers, clubs, or groups that sprung up around the uh, country during the Depression and so forth. And they were um, instruments of the Communist Party, essentially. John Reed, he gave a speech in Portland, Oregon, to this group, because he was originally from Portland. And so they had brought him in to give the speech. And so here he comes, and they're so excited about him giving the speech. And so they, they're talking about what is the First World War about? What is World War I about? And so he gets up after all this you know, uh, pomp and circumstance, and then he just says, profits, and then sits back down. That's, that's the, that's, that was his speech, you know, profits. And, and truly, that's what it was about. So why I went there is because, like a lot of times, you know, we talk about uh, weaknesses of the movement and strengths of our movements and so forth. And for me, the, the, the key question is always, the state, the state, you know, we need a deeper understanding of the state. You know, I think theoretically, I mean, practically, we're going to get it whether we like it or not. But theoretically, you know, understanding what the state is, how it came into existence, and so forth. And so I strongly recommend reading, Lenin has a little pamphlet. I got it for 25 cents. It clarified much more than some of the $10,000 speeches that I've heard over the years. You know, so 25 cents you can get. It's just called The State, simply it's about 38 pages or so. Uh, another is The State and Revolution. Because The State is a question that you find in Flint, the, the question of the water and the EPA, the question in Baltimore regarding Freddie Gray, the question in, of Akai Gurley with Ken Thompson over in the BK. So it's The State. And then the circus that comes up every four years, um, that's all about the state. Because in 2008, you know, I lost a lot of friendships in 2008 <laughs> because people lost their fuck. Oh, excuse me, they lost their minds. You know, they, you know, they lost their minds. And so, and, you know, perhaps my friendships will recover, maybe not. But that was about the state, you know, because they thought, you know, this uh, Messiah had come and you know, was going to emancipate us and liberate us and so forth, and you know, it's just a continuation. And so, finally, the, the last point I'd like to make on the state is about this whole thing about uh, voting. You know, it's like the end-all, be-all. You know, it's like uh, people died for you to get the right to vote. Now, I don't think uh, people necessarily died for the right to vote. They were fighting for something broader called freedom, you know, that's the way I understood it. Mm -hmm. Voting was one aspect of it. So anyway, this piece I have is called Sold Singers. Singing against backgrounds of crackling flames, so low their bass reverberated Booker T. Drowning out shouts and shots of us no names. <coughs> The big voice is all crew, way, way, way off key. Mint fresh faces of Franklin, Cleveland, and Chase inspired their song with an amazing grace. Black is beautiful, but green power sounds sweeter, not rocking the boat. Being dutiful, let us Seize the hour and let us lower our note. Sing shuffling ditties as the 70s swung in. They rocked like Booker T and other sold men. Oh, so low they'd sing a simple song. The best things in life are free. So what if loving you is wrong? You can't prove that by me. And they'd even get down like James Brown on bended knees, screaming and begging, baby, please, 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 baby, please go vote. The battle's no longer in the streets. Baby, please go vote.
go vote. We fight now for leather seats. Baby, please go vote. I, 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 I know the white man done you wrong. Baby, please go vote. Vote for me and make us strong. Baby, please go vote. You suffered enough, heaven knows. Baby, please go vote. Let me and I'll heal your woes. Baby, please go vote. I, 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 I want to be your next congressman. Baby, please go vote. Promise to ban the Ku Klux Klan. Baby, please go vote. And look into all racist attacks. Baby, please go vote. From the hills across the tracks. Baby, please go vote. So don't protest or demonstrate. Baby, please go vote. Let me, I negotiate. Baby, please go vote. I, 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 I. Promises, 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 and their makers come and go till we sing, we shall overthrow. <laughs> discussion to everyone, um, also to panelists, if, if you have questions for each other, I want to make sure you, you can do that as well, but I want to open up to everyone here. Yes? Um, okay, so, um, well, first of all, it's good thing not to be the only Chicano in here, right? So, um, so you know, I'm from California, so it's very uh, rare to run into Chicano, right? Or people that identify with Chicano, not too many mm -hmm. people understand what that is, right? So, um, one, one of the things that, um, I've come to understand, right? I have a historical analysis and a lived experience of the carceral regimes of North America, right? And, and uh, one thing that I've come to understand is that uh, my analysis and my experience are handcuffed together, right? Mm -hmm. um, I come into this space after serving 14 years in prison. Um, I went in at the age of 16, mm -hmm. and I got out at the age of 30. Um, I spent seven years in solitary confinement um, for being a, a, a validated gang member um, based on uh, having in my possessions um, a, a newsletter from the Chicano Mexicano Prison Project, which has a Mexican flag, the Mexican flag, the symbol of supposedly, according to institutional gang investigators, <laughs> a symbol of the Mexican mafia. Mm -hmm. I had, um, I, I had a, a, a calendar that my mom would send me with Aztec drawings and Maya drawings, right? Because I was very attached to my culture since I was a little baby, right? Ever since I was being told I was a wetback, that I was a beaner. Mm -hmm. Even though I was conditioned to hate my culture, the more the people took me down, the more I ran to it, right? Mm -hmm. In, in, uh, but I didn't really understand what it meant, right, to be empowered by my culture, right? But, you know, sitting in solitary confinement, right, um, California State Prison is very racially segregated mm -hmm. and geographically segregated within, with, even within our own raza, right? <clears throat> and one thing that I understood is uh, um, connecting the past to the present, but not only that, but also how, it how your lived experience plays a role in that, right? And, and, and um, for me, um, I really looked at history, right? Not, 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 not a... <coughs> I'm a historian not by, by training, but by experience, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and so a lot of things that happened in the past continue to happen today in the present, right? Even in, you know, in California State Prison, right, where, where, where you're not supposed to know your history, you're not supposed to know your culture because of that, you're deemed a threat and can be put in solitary confinement for the rest of your life, right? Where yet you can stab somebody and go to the shoe for like nine months and then get out and then stab somebody else and then you know continue that cycle and because that's, that's what they want they want you to continue that cycle but yet when you're empowering yourself and have an analysis of the system then you become a threat mm -hmm. right and, and, and but i think it's important to understand though that that it takes time to get to that point yo mm -hmm. it took me a long time mm -hmm. to understand that that my own raza who lived five blocks away from me weren't my enemies Mm -hmm. But were my false enemies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to gangbang against my own brown people. I went to prison. 
and was conditioned to hate black people, right? I was already going into prison with that mentality, right? That, that when I get to prison, it's blacks over here, blacks over there, whites over there, Norteños, Sureños, all these different factions, right? And, and, um, but it took me a long time. It wasn't until I got into solitary confinement that all of these things began to come this, de decolonize myself, right? But it was a process, and, and we, it's important not to put pressure, especially on the youth, to, you know, that, that they have to see things now, right? It, t it, it takes time. You know, we have to plant those seeds, right? We have to plant those seeds, and, and, and it's, uh, there's this story, right, of a, uh, uh, that comes out of the, the Easy Island, the, the Zapatista movement, right, that Marcos talks about. An old man in a village who planted these seeds, right, to grow these big trees that were going to, you know, they were going to grow up, you know, seven generations later, right, but everybody would make fun of them, like, you're an old man, you're never going to see these trees. Mm -hmm. And this thing was like, it's not about me, mm -hmm. it's about the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's, uh, what's really interesting about what you're talking about for me, so I work inside the prisons of California, and I've had been doing it since I was 19, up until <coughs> I was like 34, um, was the fact that my people, in, in California, there's gangs up and down the state, and there are more prisons um, than there are universities. So they say, you know, they build prisons every year and they will build a new UC every 25 years. Unfortunately, um, Latinos are the only ethnic group that has the, um, the most gang prisons. Um, prison gangs, right? So we have, and I don't need to describe them, but my role um, when I was being mentored by a man by the name of Nane Alejandres, who runs an organization called Barrios Unidos, he's my mentor. He groomed me to work in prisons with him to actually do peace work. And what I learned about our people, again, you know, when you were telling the story, what was coming up for me was hair, and it's because I grew up hating my hair and my features because I look different and now I straighten it. So again, whitewashing and white supremacy is, is at its core. But those are the structures of racism, <coughs> what you're talking about, right? So we think we hate ourselves and we think we hate black people, right? And it's people like ourselves that need, again, to be that bridge and to <coughs> erase what's been being said to our people, right? Because I'm a Latina on the Black Lives Matter movement and I get called very ugly things. And I always say, there has been whitewashing in Latin America. Those slave boats didn't just come to America. They, right. they went all over the world, and particularly Latino America. And we know as Mexicans, there are 1.9 Afro-Mexicanos in our country that were just identified through the census, right? But there is this whitewashing that happens that does not allow us to connect to one another, right? So what they do is they create these institutions that brainwash us and allow us to believe that we are a threat to each other and to, our, and, and to people who we could actually find commonality to. And I think it's really um, interesting that that's your lived experience, right? That's never been my lived experience, but I see it. And it is our responsibility not to put the pressure on our young people, but to shed light and to constantly feed them with hope and, and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for raising that up. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and thank you. Um, and I, I would just like to say, you know, when we talk about white supremacy and decolonizing, you use the word decolon decolonizing our minds, <coughs> ourselves. It's one recognizing, a lot of us don't even recognize that we are colonial subjects. Mm -hmm. We don't understand what Malcolm said about how this place has you um, loving your enemies and hating your friends. Mm -hmm. Right, and what you know, really true education. These schools, even when you go to school, you are not truly educated. Right, you are made into a slave. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's coupling your lived experience with also <clears throat> creating the kinship and the communities to really study, like you mentioned, the Zapatistas. You mentioned like Corky Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. When you have people around you that can share with you what you said your mother did like that's an act of resistance yeah that whether or not your mother called herself a radical woman or a revolutionary woman she was resisting by making sure that those seeds were planted and it's just so important that we understand that <clears throat> schools are not meant to teach children who they are they are meant to perpetuate this system Mm -hmm. Right, and the more we learn that and understand that, then we will create enclaves where we are truly educating people and not making them perpetuate this 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 system of um, 
of oppression because identity is the most powerful thing we have. It's like That's Stephen right. Biko says, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind mm -hmm. of the oppressed. Yes. So if I make you feel like people who look like you, because we commit crimes with so-called crimes where we are. Capitalists commit crimes on Wall Street because that's where they are, mm -hmm. right? They're running insurance companies and banks, and so they commit crimes where they are. We're committing where we are, and it's reflected on each other, and we believe what the media, the corporate media, and their history books and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we, I'm an educator with young people, <coughs> to not get mad at them yeah. for not knowing, to understand that they are victims of the war that has been taking place on our liberation. And these separations, I mean, even coming out of sharecropping, you know, when they saw black and white people working together, they had to create the system to, to, to make you, no, you're better than them. They're taking from you because they can't have the solidarity of class. Mm -hmm. So then they, you know, all of these things that this is a social construction race, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yes. I want to pick you Oh, back. no, we have a, a, another yeah. I'll, I'll be oh. quick. Uh, I, uh, oh, oh well, actually, you know, let me, Matt, why don't you, you want to finish what you're... Uh, I just want to pick you at this point, but I hate then, to... And then we'll go to you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be brief. Yeah. And I, I also had a question okay. uh, for fellow panelists, but we can, I can ask the question, but we can yep. put that on the list of questions. Yep, Matt, then you're um, right. No, I just wanted to piggyback, because I remembered the good news that I want to say, and, and, and Brittany, oh, right. no, it's, it's also that, you know, I mean, uh, part of the good news is, is the people sitting to both of my sides, but uh, something the thing Brittany and, and Dave Quee said helped trigger and that memory, but also bring it to the fore. Uh, you know, I was thinking a lot from old left to new left to next left to now uh, in thinking about today, and, and one of the things I do think, you know, the old left in some ways was steeped in this uh, important analysis about class, and I think in some ways the new left understood or try to begin to understand uh, the significance of national liberation, the significance of white supremacy, and, and uh, something that we're still, I think, learning, trying to learn, uh, which is that it's not just about a, a prison industrial complex, it's about a prison house of nations, it's about an empire, it's about imperialism as a system, and land as a basis of freedom. Mm -hmm. So we have, okay, yes, Puerto Rico, that's easy, that's clear, but we also have uh, you know, half of Mexico, we have yeah. New Africa, you know, Azatlan, New Africa, we have nations uh, inside this empire that mm -hmm. need freedom, and freedom fighters who fight for that uh, get in prison. And, you know, the good news is, uh, the good news piece of it is not only I think that that analysis is clearer, that it's sharper, that in <laughs> this moment, that this, uh, this period of history has more of us with an understanding of it, but it is that uh, at least in terms of Black Lives Matter and all of its facets, unlike, I think, Occupy, this, this they uh, is not a, a moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Occupy was more of a moment than a movement, but mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter is a movement. Mm -hmm. It is more than a single organization, but it is absolutely certainly a movement. And I think uh, part of the challenges of the movement, part of the challenges now of the movement, is to take this consciousness, which has come down, in, in, you know, in your blood, as you mm -hmm. said, uh, and, and actualize it in terms of real space, real coalition, real action. And I think, yes, it's true in some ways, just by being together, you know, just by beginning to conversate, beginning to strategize together, beginning to share resources, beginning to share best practices, and beginning to take steps at acting together, we are doing that. Mm -hmm. But I think that's really, in some ways, the, the, the good news and the challenge, to take that consciousness around prison house of nations, around imperialism, and actualize it in our relationships, personally, organizationally, et cetera. My questions are twofold, and I'll just say them, and then I will shut up. Um, first, there is something Dequi and Sekou talks about, and you spoke about it at one of the earlier of these three forms, about lessons of COINTELPRO, mm -hmm. and about things we do well and things we don't do so well, that I'd love you to say again. And the other thing, which is really for quite a bit later, is since we've had this dynamic poetry here, mm -hmm. I think when we get toward the, the end of this time together, you should close us with a poem. Those are my two mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello. Can I add some dancing to it? Yeah, sure. Absolutely, yes. Dancing and poetry together, because she's yeah. amazing. All right. It's amazing. Hello. So just put that on the list towards the end. Okay. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. I just got here. I was in an interview and a meeting. But uh, yeah, I just want to touch real, I'll, I'll be quick about this. Um, uh, my background is uh, culture, anthropology, language, and psychology, and, and 
and social science. So the way people are divided and conquered, the sharecropping, the science of division and otherizing people, and, and I think there can be a science of unity where you can bring people into a humanizing conversation mm. across ideology, across different dogmas, and even get millions of self-described conservatives to be willing to sit down and listen to Black Lives Matter, and even if they don't buy into, say, critical race theory, there's some dogmatic differences, they can still find ways to humanize one another and then converge on some common ground, even if they're not from the same background. So my question would be about, and there's a project I'm working on called Reason Revival and other things what's about- called? What's it called? Uh, Reason Revival. Reason um, Revival? Yeah, reasonrevival.net. We're just bringing like, lots of media, like radios, podcasts, people sitting around the table drinking beer, anything we can. And the goal is to get more and more people to, to, to so basically, the dogma and ideology and tribalism have been polarizing people in this country, but we have this kind of self-segregation mm -hmm. where we are not talking to each other. So you could take a God-fearing, gun-toting Texan who's pro-family who lives out in the countryside and identifies as a conservative, who has all his information about black lives comes from Fox News, and yet this person probably shares a lot of the same values about um, <clears throat> self-determination mm -hmm. and human autonomy, if they were to learn about corporate power in Latin America, they would be, they would have every reason to be offended and to hear humanizing stories like the one you told. They would realize that as conservatives who <coughs> values autonomy, they should be just as offended as anybody by corporate power. We've been so reflexively balkanized into this sort of us versus them tribalism, mm -hmm. where if liberals and the left is talking about corporate power, they reflexively avoid that and say, well, that's them and not us. But if we can transcend some of these de debasing dogmas and, and try transcend this tribalism, and just have conversations by the millions, get millions of people on that are more to the right to just talk and find out what they have in common, and focus on commonalities rather than otherizing. I think we should have an arms race of doing that. There's tools mm -hmm. in moral psychology to do that, and this panel is a great example. So yeah, thoughts on that, I'd love to you know, talk about afterward. Or, yeah. arms race. Sure. So one of the things that we do within the gathering is that we introduce, um, we do a two-day core in communities. And some of the communities will, or some of our trainings will in include teachers, probation officers, um, people, young people who just got suspended, people who are coming out of prison, right? And what's really interesting about that is we do a values worksheet Right. And so people will then say, well, you know, I'm a probation officer and I believe all people who do this should be locked up. Right. But once we actually analyze the, val the, the, work the worksheet, everybody has common values. Yeah. And what you're saying is so important because um, we run program inside of the detention centers. And a lot of the times the young people, when we do like film or movement or critical writing, their writings are very reflective of their community and what they've been exposed to. And so sometimes it'll have something like, you know, they'll talk about women and they'll yeah. glamorize violence and guns. And so, like I said in the beginning, I'm a facilitator of a process. So I'll begin to bring in film and have the young people dissect it, whether it's through movement, critical thinking, whatever it will be. The writings then reflect the knowledge that they're learning, right? And also incorporate their, 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 um, they'll begin to tell their story. And so the judges will do a major theater, per theater performance or spoken word performance put on by the young people. I just wow. facilitate the process. The judges, their parents, and the staff will come along with the 70 young other young people that are incarcerated with them. And people will be like, oh my god, I need to sign that young person. Or the judges will be like, oh my god. And yeah. it's because you're humanizing right. yeah. individuals, right? It's mm -hmm. by it's storytelling, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Some of American models that mm -hmm. are Mm -hmm. yeah. awesome. Also, too, the um, Southern Theater um, in New Orleans, they use the method of, they have a method that was brought out of the Civil Rights Movement, um, story circle methodology that they go around and help facilitate stories and things like mm -hmm. that, which really helped during Katrina, the um, mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. of them telling their stories, but mm -hmm. fighting for, for land, fighting for their rights in New Orleans still. So, yeah, to say that. Um, babe, would you like to add something? Because mm -hmm. when no. I was this, no. No. I'm fine. I'm so okay. can I say, okay, because I just, <laughs> when I was listening to you speak, I was, I was thinking about um, uh, some experiences that Sekou has had in um, 
in in prison with with you know I mean because what you said about the you know they just like there's apartheid America there's apartheid America in prison mm -hmm. so sure. but when people talk to each other and you may not like you may not say okay I'm not gonna be working on your side but I can at least agree to disagree or I can we have these things in common and so it's really it is so much work. I mean just even the fact that you know like um that we're all in this room right mm -hmm. Brittany says we have to uh, like language is really important so sometimes when people hear the word pro-black or when they say black power right. that makes people feel like well I can't be included in that because if you say pro-black you mean right. you don't like white people right. right or when you speak up for the liberation of black people or the oppression of being against the oppression that well you hate white people mm -hmm. no that's not what that's mm -hmm. not what we're saying but we the, the, the this place is so methodical the, those so-called mis missionary schools mm -hmm. when they took the Australians took the indigenous people when the Europeans here took the indigenous people when they put on put Africans on those slave ships and I mean the indoctrination like it's this it's so important the work that you're doing it's so important that the work that people are doing individually and collectively like in small ways is tackling that because that's that's huge. Like, how do we go against the corporate media that just, like you said, they create yeah. these divisions? Alternative. Like, it's a mon it's a monster, monster. And the only way we do that is like with people doing these projects that you're talking about, and you doing the work that you're doing. I'm sorry because this person keeps raising this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a very, uh, a very short question, but it's more of a political strategy question because. We're spending a lot of time discussing incarceration. Mass incarceration is a huge problem, but I think a lot of uh, people don't realize that most of that is upon the states. The states are the results, are, are where most of the mass incarceration takes place. And there's been a lot of focus on federal mass incarceration, and the president has commuted quite a few sentences, but that's only so much, there's only so much that the president can do. What is, what is the uh, political strategy, if any at this point, to focus on a 50 state campaign to reduce mass incarceration nationally? Well, I can say that there's an organization, the Drug Policy Alliance, right, is an organization that's working on decriminalization of marijuana because there's so many people in prison based on that. Uh, here in New York, um, the Correctional Association created mm -hmm. a campaign called uh, Release Asian People in From Prison, RAP, mm -hmm. right? That's being picked up around the country. People around the country are talking about um, Asian people in, um, in prison. People are, you know, working on tackling the parole apparatus so that people get released because it's so little opportunity for people to be released mm -hmm. on parole because mm -hmm. people are denied parole like 10, 12 times, right? So there are pockets and places where people are um, looking at um, uh, prisons, like re reducing the prison population. But again, that's historical because as far as I'm concerned, as an African person, this, uh, a descendant of African enslaved Africans, America means prisons is what Malcolm said, right? Mm -hmm. So it is tied to how you're going to, you, if you don't have jobs here, then prisons is tied to that because you've outsourced all, all, the, all the jobs. So it's tied to the economics of capitalism, of imperialism. So we can't talk about mass imprisonment without talking about all of those, about all of those things. But I do know of those pockets of places where people are working on specific um, areas about tackling the prison, mass imprisonment, right? And just to add to what she said, so um, I'm part of a, um, so the Gathering for Justice is focused on building a national movement to end child incarceration. So we work with organizations across mm -hmm. the country, allowing them to keep their autonomy, but bringing them together to actually build collective power. There's another organization called the National Juvenile Justice Network that has anywhere from advocacy groups, from, you know, um, 
direct service groups, whatever policy groups that are coming together to minimize the amount of children being incarcerated and raising the age of criminal responsibility. New York State and North Carolina are two states where 16 year olds are automatically tried as adults. Um, the Correctional Association is spearheading that uh, campaign and we are one of the organizations that are involved with it. But so for me, what's really interesting is that I worked creating detention alternatives um, in Santa Cruz County and then ultimately was recruited into the probation department to do gender responsive programming for girls. Mm -hmm. I created a, a task, force, task force called the Girls Task Force to improve uh, services to girls regardless of probation. When I was recruited, I never thought I'd be a probation officer. I studied psychology, you know, I, I studied psychology for South Healing. But um, what was really interesting is that they were working in collaboration with policy institutes like the Burns Institute to do system accountability from within, right? Our neighboring county, which was Monterey County, was extremely punitive compared to Santa Cruz, which was just a neighbor like, you know, you could hop over and it's a completely different time that you're doing in prison than you are in Santa Cruz, right? Very different policies. Um, and you're right, we work state by state when it comes to even the Black Lives Matter movement. We have very specific demands on a statewide level, right? But we come together under the banner of Black Lives Matter. And, um, but I, I truly believe, and I've been speaking to several individuals on creating a federal mandate on system accountability, but we really need to look at it by city, locality, even county, whatever it may be, in order for us to get to that point. And people are doing it, like there's Prop 47 um, that was in California. I know Glenn Martin here in New York is doing some great work around um, trying to cut, you know, 50% of the population by 20, whatever it may be. But that was a great question. Thank you for asking it. Mm -hmm. I think we also, have time maybe also, for, oh, okay, yeah. go ahead. And then um, no working with that. shutting down Ruckus Island, mm -hmm. we're um, focusing right. on close um, records. Yeah, mm -hmm. close Ruckus right. Island. We're focusing on once that facility is shut down, how does how does it realize itself? Is it could it be a space that is is um, more towards healing and providing inmates with what they need, mm -hmm. as far yeah. as um, Education, um, healing, is it, um, I mean, I, I told them political education, but <laughs> you know, these type, many type of things inside of there, is it, what, what would the walls look like? What, what is the lighting? Reimagining what, something different. Reimagining something different that could, could help really, really help um, give our youth what they need. And so, closing records of island, outside of, you know, um, people like corporations like the airport buying into it because they want a piece of land, you know, but also, you no, know, how can we use it for, for us in, in a sense of. But even looking at, uh, sorry, I'm yeah, just, go ahead. Um, but also looking at closing down Rikers, right? There are campaigns that happen in California with the Bus Not Bars uh, campaign where they were looking at shutting down Chad, right? Closing down one of the harshest juvenile facilities where they were actually caging children to go to school. And so looking at, you know, just kind of again, uh, collaborating, building, building collective power, looking at what worked, what didn't work, how is it that we could use the models? You know, Connecticut was just one of the newest um, uh, states that raise the age of criminal responsibility. So I think it's important in places like this that we also network, we learn about, you know, we up here are not the experts of the movement. We nest, we do have knowledge, but I think also we recognize that there's a collective expertise um, and coming together and networking is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I think we can do one more question and I'll then be really quick. Okay. Um, that fits with what I was going to ask. Um, I feel like I have so much to learn. And I work in the UAW in an adult ed, and our, our motto is everyone has something to teach and everyone has something to learn. Mm -hmm. And I feel because I started working when I was, you know, in the movement when I was 15, which was um, 60 years ago, that I. I feel that what could grow out of this moment that could be something that really important would be to have times when we take the time for folks who've been doing the work a long time and folks who are doing the work now into the future 
meeting together to tell our stories. Absolutely. And I don't think we do that enough. You know, I think we talk cerebrally a lot, but I don't think we tell our stories to each other enough. And we have so much to learn from each other. So I just would like to propose that out of this, if it were possible, another time is set that we do that, that we do that, that we talk to each other and tell each other's stories and help each other bridge what is so beautifully being created into the future, uh, essentially with Black Lives Matter. Thank you. I think that that's a great idea. That goes back to what I said about what we what we had then, what we don't have now is space. Mm -hmm. Because having those conversations is necessary and vital, but it's also like, okay, so, we, you know, like, we get we charged like $200 for a room. Yeah. Right. You know, like, yeah. yeah. Actually, it wasn't 50 years, it was 47 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. right. <laughs> so shall we end with poetry and some dance? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> How, how can I do? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, gonna take, uh, Brittany's gonna take. Thank you, babe. All right. Because I was just gonna look for a Sada's poem. Okay. Oh, right. yes, it oh, wow. is. And I was 15. Yes, he's <laughs> ready. He got it. He liked that one. <laughs> Which book is this? Okay, so this is from an event that Sekou went to uh, by a young poet by the name of Christian R Richardson Jordan. And she wrote this book, published uh, Mules Fight Back. So the name of this poem is Fear. I'm not scared of the last dangerous neighborhood featured on the nightly news. I don't fear same-sex couples communists or homeless men, so-called terrorists, nor foreigners on our shores, not afraid of the drug war so much as I fear thugs in blue. And I'm neither worried about nor glued to what celebs do. Don't have time for pettiness. I'm afraid we won't make it. That somehow the freedom songs and poems won't be enough. That even after all sorts of freedom fighting, there's just still too much stuff. Mm -hmm. I fear this world's impact on little ones, the lies we tell on those who don't fit in. I'm afraid of how we keep defining and redefining human to keep someone else out. I worry about fear and fear baiting and how we encage our brains. Fear the way we cast blame and fear more of the same. 2015, Christian Richardson Jordan. Hmm.